Welcome back to the CCSP Exam Cram Series 2023 edition in this installment covering every topic in the official exam syllabus for Domain 6 of the CCSP exam. As someone in a cybersecurity leadership role who works with these technologies every day, I'm certain you're going to find the CCSP exam challenging, but equally confident you'll find the skills you take away very relevant in your future cybersecurity roles. More importantly, last year I helped hundreds of thousands just like you achieve cybersecurity certifications like the Security Plus, the CISSP, and now bringing that formula to the CCSP exam to help you prepare for exam day without the need for expensive boot camps. We'll cover the CCSP syllabus in six parts, one video for each domain of the CCSP exam, focusing today on domain six and when the series is complete, I'll release a consolidated full course video. The focus of Domain 6 is legal risk and compliance. As always, I recommend the CCSP official exam study guide and practice test bundle to help prepare, which includes a thousand practice questions, two practice exams, and flashcards to help you review. You can find a link to the latest and least expensive copy on Amazon.com in the video description. Also, to help you prepare for exam day, I've included a PDF copy of this presentation. You'll find the download link in the video description. And while you're down there, note that you'll find a clickable copy of the table of contents of this video so you can move forward and back through the video as you need as you're preparing for exam day. So let's dive into Domain 6, Legal Risk and Compliance. And as always, we're going to begin with a look at the exam essentials, those topics the official study guide promises will factor on exam day. And domain six is some of the most important content, not only for this exam, but for your cybersecurity career. We'll touch on the different sources of law in the United States. We'll have a look at the difference between criminal and civil liability and what liability is exactly. The four elements of tort of negligence. Then we'll get into e-discovery issues. We'll talk chain of custody when it comes to digital evidence, knowing the purpose of e-discovery, the role of ISO 27050, and some guidance from the Cloud Security Alliance. Really frameworks that help guide our efforts in e-discovery. Describing the sensitive information types, as well as the major laws that govern security and privacy in the cloud. We're going to take a look at many different frameworks with heavy focus on digital forensics, incident response, and risk management. Common policies used in an organization's security program. We'll spend a fair bit of time on vendors, supply chain and external risk, and risk management strategies that an organization may adopt. And here we'll spend some time on what we call risk treatment, talking through responses to risk, like mitigation, avoidance, transference, acceptance. We'll start with 6.1, articulate legal requirements and unique risks within the cloud environment. Here we'll cover conflicting international legislation, evaluation of legal risks specific to cloud computing, legal frameworks and guidelines, e-discovery, and forensic requirements. Let's start with conflicting international legislation. So it's important to be aware of the various laws and regulations that govern cloud computing and remembering that our presence in the cloud is quite often global. Our customers and customer data may be stored in multiple countries and laws can introduce risks to a business, fines, penalties, even the loss of the ability to do business in a certain place. It's important to identify these risks and make recommendations to mitigate them, just like any other risk. So there's a really easy example I can cite where two laws conflict in the cloud, or at least may conflict in the wrong situation. So for example, GDPR, an EU law that forbids the transfer of data to countries that lack adequate privacy concerns. I can promise you the EU is none too excited about sensitive information being transferred to the United States. However, the Clarifying Law Overseas Use of Data, or Cloud Act, requires CSPs like Microsoft, Amazon, and Google to hand over data to aid an investigation of serious crimes 
even if that data is stored in another country. And for a customer, that raises a very serious question. Which law prevails when the two are in conflict? Well, things can get complicated here. And as with many aspects of security, legal compliance requires collaboration. Legal counsel should be part of the evaluation of any cloud-specific risks, legal requests, and the company's response to these. Remembering that the consumer is responsible for navigating these challenges. The CSP will give you third-party audit documents, other assurance documents explaining how they will respond in particular situations, but ultimately legal responsibility falls to the consumer. And whether we say consumer or customer, we're talking about the organization who is the customer of the CSP. A couple of high-level concepts related to encryption and privacy I want to mention. So computer export controls. U.S. companies can't export certain computer tech to what are deemed rogue nations. Cuba, Iran, North Korea, Sudan, and Syria. And the Department of Commerce also details some limitations on export of encryption products outside the U.S. I'm not sure either of those will come up on the exam. It is worth mentioning that the basis for privacy rights in the U.S. is the Fourth Amendment of our Constitution. And you'll likely see GDPR multiple times on the exam. It's not a U.S. law, but it's very likely to be mentioned because it is the gold standard when it comes to privacy protections for users. And it applies to any company with customers in the EU. So it doesn't matter the country in which the company is based. If they have customers in the EU, then they are subject to GDPR regulation if they want to do business in the EU. And we'll look at GDPR from a couple of different angles in this domain. So moving on, cloud practitioners do need to be aware of multiple sets of laws and regulations and the risks introduced in conflicting legislation across jurisdictions. So I gave you an example, but let's just talk through some of the scenarios where conflicts can come into play. Copyright and intellectual property law, particularly the jurisdictions that companies need to deal with local versus international to protect and enforce their IP. Not every country respects intellectual property rights as the United States does. There are safeguards and security controls required for privacy compliance, particularly details of data residency or the ability to move data between countries, as well as varying requirements of due care in different jurisdictions. You know, as we've talked about a couple of times already with GDPR, we have a pretty high bar of due care around data privacy in the EU. Data breaches in their aftermath, particularly breach notification. A bit later, we'll call out the laws that include a breach notification requirement. And finally, international import and export laws particularly technologies that may be sensitive or illegal to import or export under various international agreements. So when we are consuming services and running subscriptions in multiple countries, we need to be familiar with the guardrails that the laws of each country impose upon us. So for the exam, you'll want to know the difference between laws, regulations, standards, and frameworks. So we'll break the difference down here quickly. First, we have laws, which are the legal rules created by government entities like the U.S. Congress. And we have regulations, which are the rules created by governmental agencies. These will include rules for regulated industries like financial services and healthcare. Laws and regulations both have to be followed or they can result in civil or criminal penalties for the organization for failing to comply. Then we have standards which dictate a reasonable level of performance. For example, we'll talk a bit later about ISO 31000, which includes several standards around creating and operating a risk management program. They can be created by an organization for its own purposes, so internally, or they can come from an industry body or a trade group, an external group. PCI DSS, for example, which came from the four major credit card companies coming together to create a standard. And finally, frameworks, which are a set of guidelines helping organizations improve their security posture. We'll touch on frameworks for e-discovery, 
for risk management from organizations like NIST, from the Cloud Security Alliance. But just commit these concepts to memory and you're going to see plenty of examples in this session. You'll also want to be familiar with types of law for the exam. So for example, criminal law contains prohibitions against acts such as murder, assault, robbery, and arson. Not our primary focus for the CCSP exam. Civil law examples would include contract disputes, real estate transactions, employment matters, estate and probate procedures, but contract disputes. When we're talking about agreements between an organization and a CSP, you can imagine civil law is something we may think about. Vendor contracts fall into this category. And then there's administrative law, policies and procedures and regulations that govern daily operations of government and government agencies. Regulations like HIPAA fall into this category. And a fourth type of law to be familiar with is constitutional law. The U.S. Constitution is the highest possible source of law in the United States, and no laws from any other source may conflict with the provisions in the Constitution. In fact, if Congress passes a law that is later found to be in conflict with the Constitution, the law is declared unconstitutional and can be struck down by the courts. So I quickly want to touch on the seven articles of the U.S. Constitution and point to what you want to remember for exam day. So Article 1 of the Constitution establishes the legislative branch of government. That includes our House of Representatives and the Senate. Article 2 establishes the executive branch, the office of the president. Article 3 establishes the judicial branch, that's our courts. Article 4 defines the relationship between the federal government and state governments. Article 5 creates a process for amending the Constitution itself. Amendments are not something that happen very often. We've had two amendments in the last 53 years. Article 6 contains the Supremacy Clause, establishing that the Constitution is the supreme law of the land. And Article 7 sets forth the process for initial establishment of the federal government. For exam day, remember this one. The Constitution is the supreme law of the land. What I said in the very first sentence on this topic, which is that it's the highest possible source of law and no laws from other sources may conflict with the Constitution. Continuing with types of law, we have case law. Interpretations made by courts over time establish a body of law that other courts may refer to when making their own decisions. And in many cases, the case law decisions made by courts are binding on both that court and any subordinate courts. Those are lesser courts in the hierarchy of the judicial system. And we have common law, which is a set of judicial precedents passed down as case law through many generations and stand as examples cited in future court cases. Contract law, violations of a contract generally do not involve law enforcement agencies, so they're treated as a private dispute between parties and handled in civil court. A violation is known as a breach of contract, and courts may take action to enforce the terms of a contract if one of the party fails to honor the terms of the contract they agreed to and signed. Related to types of law, are types of legal liability. Liable means responsible or answerable in law, legally obligated. And that can mean legal obligation to do something or obligation to not do something. For purposes of our discussion, there are two types of legal liability you want to be familiar with. Criminal liability, which occurs when a person violates a criminal law and civil liability, which occurs when one person claims that another person has failed to carry out a legal duty that they were responsible for. Civil cases are brought to court by one party called the claimant, who is accusing another party of a violation called the respondent. The claimant may be an individual, a corporation, or the government, as may be the respondent. You're also expected to be familiar with legal risks specific to cloud computing. Legal, regulatory, and compliance risks in the cloud can be significant for certain types of data or industries. So there are differing legal requirements to consider. For example, state and provincial laws in the United States and Canada have different requirements for data breach notifications, such as the timeframes. 
different legal systems and frameworks in different countries. In some countries, clear written legislation exists. In others, legal precedent is more important. Precedent refers to the judgment in past cases and is subject to change over time with less advance notice than updates to legislation. We talked about precedent when we were discussing common law and case law in the U.S. just a bit earlier. And conflicting laws. The European Union's GDPR and the U.S. Cloud Act directly conflict on the topic of data transfer, as we saw in the example we looked at earlier. But these unique legal risks specific to the cloud are a direct result of the global nature of the cloud. The fact that as a cloud consumer, we're very likely to have data and services residing in data centers in multiple countries around the world, subject to the unique legal regulatory and compliance restrictions of the jurisdiction where they reside. So a few things to bear in mind when it comes to the bottom line on legal risks specific to cloud computing. Responsibility for compliance with laws and regulations. Researching and planning response in case of conflicting laws. Ensuring necessary audit and incident response data is logged and retained. And any additional due diligence and due care are all the responsibility of the cloud consumer the customer. There are several legal frameworks and guidelines you should be familiar with for the exam that affect cloud computing environments. One of those is the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, the OECD, which is an international organization. It's comprised of 38 members, including the United States, but members from around the world, and it publishes guidelines on data privacy, Many of its principles are aligned with European privacy law, including consent, transparency, accuracy, security, and accountability. Then there's the Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation Privacy Framework, or APEC, which is comprised of 21 member economies in the Pacific Rim. APEC incorporates many standard privacy practices into their guidance, including preventing harm, notice, consent, security, and accountability, many of the same standards that we see represented in OECD and GDPR. But APEC promotes the smooth cross-border flow of information between APEC member nations. That is the scope of their focus. Then we have the European Union's GDPR, the General Data Protection Regulation, which is perhaps the most far-reaching and comprehensive set of laws ever written to protect data privacy. It mandates privacy for individuals. It defines companies' duty to protect personal data, and it prescribes punishments for companies violating these laws. It includes mandatory notification timelines in the event of data breach. And for this exam, I expect you'll need awareness of standards, laws, and regulations that include mandatory notification timelines for data breach. I don't believe you'll be quizzed on any specific timeline limits. For example, in GDPR, that timeline is 72 hours. I don't believe the exam is going to get that deep on you. GDPR does formally define many data roles as well related to privacy and security, like subject, controller, and processor. We will touch on those later in this session. You will want to be familiar, understand the difference, and understand who is liable in the event of data breach, who the owner is. Some additional legal frameworks and standards likely to get mentioned on the exam include Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, commonly referred to simply as HIPAA. It's a law that regulates privacy and control of health information data in the U.S. Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard, or PCI DSS, which is an industry standard for companies that accept, process, or receive payment card transactions. Next is Privacy Shield, which exists to solve the lack of a U.S. equivalent to GDPR, which impacts rights and obligations around data transfer. And Sarbanes-Oxley, commonly called SOX, is a law enacted in 2002, and it sets requirements for U.S. public companies to protect financial data when it's stored and used. So this exam does not expect you to be a legal expert, but you'll notice here when I'm calling out legal frameworks, standards, and guidelines, I'm giving you some identifying characteristics. 
You don't need to be an expert on HIPAA or PCI or SOX to pass this exam, but you do need to know what their content covers and where they apply. If you see a question about U.S. law and protected health information, HIPAA is quite likely going to be an answer. If you hear anything about protecting financial data in a publicly traded company, SOX is the first regulation I'd think of. You'll also need to know the difference between statutory, regulatory, and contractual requirements. Statutory requirements are required by law. For example, HIPAA, GDPR, and FERPA are three statutory requirements. Then we have regulatory requirements, which may also be required by law, but refer to rules issued by a regulatory body that is appointed by a government entity. FISMA and FedRAMP are two good examples. And then we have contractual requirements, which are required by a legal contract between private parties. And these agreements often specify a set of security controls or a compliance framework that must be implemented by a vendor. For example, the contract may require that we leverage SOC or generally accepted privacy principles or CSA's cloud controls matrix. PCI DSS is a good example of a contractually enforced regulatory requirement. And there are some challenges and complexities that we need to consider in the cloud, especially when it comes to e-discovery and our supply chain. So an organization investigating an incident may lack the ability to compel the CSP to turn over vital information needed to investigate. This is where a good contract with your CSP is going to be important. The information may be housed in a country where jurisdictional issues make the data more difficult to access. Like the EU, where GDPR applies. Maintaining a chain of custody is more difficult because there are more entities involved in the process and their physical location more geographically dispersed on the whole. Three important considerations include vendor selection, architecture, and understanding your due care obligations going into the situation. As we're evaluating a CSP selection or a vendor selection, we need to think about the architecture that they're working with and our due care obligations because that will impact our ability in an e-discovery scenario to capture the data we need for response. Let's unpack those three a bit further, starting with vendor selection. So when considering a cloud vendor, e-discovery should be considered a security requirement during the selection and contract negotiation phases. We know we're going to be limited in our ability to compel a CSP to produce data during e-discovery unless it is mandated in writing in a contract. Architecture considerations. We know data residency and system architecture are important because our data is going to tend to be distributed in the cloud. We need to think about the impact to e-discovery proactively, such as when designing or deploying a system or a business process. So we're thinking about how data privacy regulations and e-discovery are going to impact us before they are impacting us. And do care considerations. Cloud security practitioners must inform their organization of any risks and require due care and due diligence related to cloud computing. As security practitioners, we need to ensure the organization is prepared for digital forensics and incident response. On the topic of e-discovery, it's important to remember that CSPs may not preserve essential data for the required period of time to support historical investigations. In fact, they may not even log all of the data relevant to support an investigation. This shifts the burden of recording and preserving potential evidence onto the consumer. That's a theme we're seeing as we move through here, right? So consumers must identify and implement their own data collection. There are e-discovery frameworks that include cloud-specific guidance that may help. So let's touch again on some of those complexities that we see in terms of digital forensics and e-discovery in the cloud, and then talk about some of those frameworks. So in the cloud, we know it's difficult or impossible to perform physical search and seizure of cloud resources like storage or hard drives. Organizations like ISO IEC and the Cloud Security Alliance provide guidance on best practices for collecting digital evidence and conducting forensics investigations in the cloud. 
every security practitioner should be familiar with the following standards, even if they don't specialize in forensics. We touched on all the relevant standards in Domain 5. We're going to revisit them again here in this context. And I did want to call out NIST IR8006. So NIST IR8006, Cloud Computing Forensic Science Challenges. So NIST IR is an acronym that may not be familiar to you. It stands for NIST Interagency or Internal Reports. It addresses common issues and solutions needed to address digital forensics and incident response in cloud environments. So DFIR, just make sure you're familiar with that acronym for the exam. If I were to just quote the summary of NIST IR8006 from the abstract, it summarizes research performed by the members of the NIST Cloud Computing Forensic Science Working Group, and it aggregates, categorizes, and discusses the forensic challenges faced by experts when responding to incidents that have occurred in a cloud computing ecosystem. In short, it is guidance for DFIR in the cloud. And that's the only net new framework I wanted to call out here. So let's revisit Domain 5. We had ISO IEC 27050, which is a four-part standard within the ISO 27000 family of information security standards. It offers a framework, governance, and best practices for forensics, e-discovery, and evidence management. Hiring an outside forensic expert is something we should all recognize as potentially the best path for many organizations. If you don't have an expert on staff, an expert makes sense because there are legal implications in digital forensics, such as chain of custody, such as how we process the evidence, capturing the original, but working on a copy, so we don't unintentionally modify the original. Many details in that process that can go wrong if you don't have the expertise. And then there's Cloud Security Alliance security guidance. There's free guidance in their Domain 3 Legal Issues, Contracts, and Electronic Discovery. It offers guidance on legal concerns related to security, privacy, and contractual obligations. It covers topics like data residency and liability of the data processor role. In fact, if we just call out all the forensic investigation standards that may come up on the exam, you see the ISO family here from 27037, 27041, 42, 43, 27050 that we just mentioned, and then the CSA guidance. So recapping the ISO family here, 27037 focuses on collecting, identifying, and preserving electronic evidence. 27041 is a guide for incident investigation. 27042 covers digital evidence analysis. And 27043 covers investigation principles and processes. Again, you don't have to be an expert on the details of these standards. You do need to know, in summary, the focus of each of these standards. So I'm trying to call out the summarization that will be relevant for you on exam day. That brings us to 6.2, understand privacy issues. Here we'll take a look at the difference between contractual and regulated private data, country-specific legislation related to private data, jurisdictional differences in data privacy, which gets interesting in the cloud where our data is generally hosted in multiple regions in different countries quite often, standard privacy requirements, so here we'll dig into GDPR a bit further, ISO 27018, as well as the generally accepted privacy principles. And we'll take a look at privacy impact assessments. Let's start with a look at types of private data at the highest level. First, we have personally identifiable information, or PII, which is any information that can identify an individual. Name, birth date and place, social security number, biometric data. This is defined by NIST Special Publication 800-122. Then we have Protected Health Information, or PHI, which is health-related information that can be related to a specific person. It must be protected by strong controls and access audited. It's regulated by HIPAA High Trust. HIPAA is the original healthcare privacy 
regulation and high trust came along later and specifically updated HIPAA regulations. And the third type of private data is payment data. So think credit card data, allowable storage of information related to credit card and debit card and transactions is defined and regulated by PCI DSS and it is contractual. It applies to those who are processing the transactions. And because it's contractual, when you decide to become a credit card processor, when you're processing transactions, the contract you sign includes your contractual agreement to be regulated by PCI DSS standards. To effectively secure this data, a security team must understand what types of data an organization is processing, where it is being processed, and any associated requirements like contractual obligations. And in any cloud computing environment, the legal responsibility for data privacy and protection rests with the cloud consumer. And the individual in the data controller role is always responsible for ensuring that the requirements for protection and compliance are met, even if that data is processed in a CSP's cloud service. So the data controller cannot transfer responsibility, but risk can be mitigated. And you will find that components of a contract may include requirements and restrictions on how data is processed, security controls, the deletion of data, physical location, audit requirements, the use of subcontractors, and if subcontractors are allowed, it may restrict their physical location. And all of these considerations fall back to the data controller as responsible. Next, we have the Australian Privacy Act which allows that organizations may process data belonging to Australian citizens offshore. At the same time, it demands that the transferring entity, the data owner, must ensure that the receiver of the data holds and processes it in accordance with the principles of Australian privacy law. The data owner, the controller, again, is responsible for data privacy. Compliance is often achieved contractually through contracts that require recipients to maintain or exceed the data owner's privacy standards. However, the entity transferring the data out of Australia remains responsible for any data breaches by or on behalf of the recipient entities. So even if the data owner and their organization have a contract with an entity processing that data, they are responsible for that entity's compliance with these standards. So again, the data owner, the controller, can mitigate the risk, but they cannot transfer the responsibility. And Canada also has a privacy law when it comes to private data. That's the Personal Information Protection and Electronic Documents Act. It's a national level law that restricts how commercial businesses may collect, use, and disclose personal information. And it covers information about an individual that is identifiable to that specific individual. DNA, age, medical data, education, employment information, any identifying numbers, information about their religion, race or ethnic origin, financial information. It's quite thorough in its coverage of what falls under personally identifiable information. And it includes a data breach notification requirement as well. And it's worth noting that the PEPIDA standard may also be superseded by province-specific laws that are deemed substantially similar to the national law. Next, we have GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation. This is the law of data privacy in the European Union, and it includes the following on data subject privacy rights. The data subject is the individual about whom data is being collected. It includes the right to be informed, the right of access, the right to rectification, the right to erasure, the right to restrict processing, the right to data portability, the right to object, and rights in relation to automated decision-making and profiling. So in short, this all adds up to a lot of control for the individual to understand what information is being collected, how it is being processed, to ask for a copy of that data, to ask an entity processing that data to stop and to erase their data, the right to correct any inaccuracies. It's really considered the gold standard when it comes to data privacy law. And other private data types in GDPR, race or ethnic origin, political affiliations or opinions, 
religious or philosophical beliefs, and sexual orientation. To summarize GDPR, it deals with the handling of data while maintaining privacy and rights of an individual. It's international because it was created by the European Union, which has 27 different countries as its members. And GDPR applies to any company with customers in the EU without regard of where that company is located. So if you're a U.S.-based company with customers in the EU, GDPR compliance applies to you. And GDPR includes a 72-hour notification deadline in the case of data breach. Now we'll shift focus to some U.S.-based laws, beginning with the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act of 1999, which focuses on services of banks, lenders, and insurance. GLBA severely limits the services they can provide and the information these entities can share with each other. This act consists of three main sections. The Financial Privacy Rule, which regulates the collection and disclosure of private financial information. The Safeguards Rule, which stipulates that financial institutions must implement security programs to protect such information. And the Pretexting Provisions, which prohibit the practice of pretexting, which is accessing private information using false pretenses. In other words, when these entities are accessing your private information, they must state a true and accurate reason for that access. Next, we have Privacy Shield, an international agreement between the U.S. and the European Union, which allows the transfer of personal data from the European economic area to the U.S. by U.S.-based companies, but is not an indicator of GDPR compliance. So organizations under Privacy Shield commit to seven principles of the agreement. Notice, choice, security, access, accountability for onward transfer, data integrity and purpose limitation, and finally, recourse enforcement and liability. So all things said, Privacy Shield extends transparency and control to the data subject, similar to what we see in GDPR. Next, we have the Stored Communications Act of 1986, an early effort in data privacy in the electronic realm. It created privacy protection for electronic communications like email or other digital communications stored on the internet. It effectively extends the Fourth Amendment of the U.S. Constitution to the electronic realm. So the Fourth Amendment is where individual privacy has its roots. The Fourth Amendment details the people's right to be secure in their persons, houses, papers, and effects against unreasonable searches and seizures. This act outlines that private data is protected from unauthorized access or interception by private parties or the government. Next, we have the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, commonly known as HIPAA, which implements privacy and security regulations requiring strict security measures for hospitals, physicians, and insurance companies. HIPAA-covered entities are those organizations that collect or generate protected health information, PHI. Under HIPAA, there are separate rules for privacy, security, and breach notification, and flow of these rules down to third parties. And flow of these rules down to third parties is important because that tells us that when data is transferred, it does not relieve the data controller of responsibility. Under HIPAA, PHI may be stored by cloud service providers, provided that the data is adequately protected. And finally, we have the Clarifying Lawful Overseas Use of Data, or Cloud Act, which aids in evidence collection in investigations of serious crimes. It was created in 2018 due to the problems the FBI faced in forcing Microsoft to hand over data stored in Ireland in the prosecution of a crime in the United States. The Cloud Act essentially requires U.S.-based companies to respond to legal requests for data no matter where the data is physically located. So it's not hard to imagine how the Cloud Act could certainly come into conflict with the EU's GDPR. Which country or countries have jurisdiction, which determines which laws apply in data security, may depend on the location of the data subject, which is the individual about whom data is being collected the data collector, the cloud service provider, 
subcontractors processing that data, or even the headquarters of the entities involved. And this raises some legal concerns. These can impact the utilization of a particular cloud service provider, add costs and time to market, and drive changes to technical architectures required to deliver the services. In other words, which laws are going to apply in a given situation may substantially impact how we deliver a service and from where, and may significantly impact the cost and level of effort based on changes we make to technical architectures and legal red tape. We never replace compliance with convenience when evaluating services as this increases risks. So even if it proves inconvenient or expensive, we can never skimp on compliance because many privacy laws impose fines or other action for non-compliance that will far outpace the money we save. So let's shift gears and have a look at a couple of those data privacy standards called out in the syllabus, starting with ISO IEC 27018, which was published in July 2014 as a component of the ISO 27001 standard. Adherence to the privacy principles in the 27,000 family enables customer trust in a CSP. Major CSPs like Microsoft, Google, and Amazon all maintain ISO 27,000 compliance. It can provide a high level of assurance. So digging into some of the principles in 27018, consent. Personal data obtained by a CSP may not be used for marketing purposes unless expressly permitted by the subject. A customer should be permitted to use a service without requiring this consent. Control. Customers shall have explicit control of their own data and how that data is used by the CSP. Transparency. CSPs must inform customers of where their data resides and any subcontractors that may process their personal data. Communication. Auditing should be in place and any incidents should be communicated to customers. And audit. Companies, the CSP in this case, must subject themselves to an independent audit on an annual basis. And that's a key phrase there, independent audit. That annual audit from an independent and trustworthy source takes us to a high level of assurance with the ISO IEC 27018 standard. Next, let's talk generally accepted privacy principles. GAP is a framework of privacy principles created by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants. GAP are widely incorporated into the SOC 2 framework as an operational criterion, and organizations that pursue a SOC 2 audit can include these privacy controls if it's appropriate. Whether or not it makes sense will generally depend on the type of service they're providing. The principles we see in the generally accepted privacy principles are similar to ISO 27018, which is an optional extension of the controls defined in ISO 27002. And an audit of these controls results in a report that can be shared with customers or potential customers who can use it to assess a service provider's ability to protect sensitive data. You'll remember from previous domains where we went to the CSP portals and we pulled down a SOC 2 Type 2 audit. It can increase assurance. Now I want to cover with you the categories of the 10 main privacy principles covered in the generally accepted privacy principles, not because you need to memorize these for the exam, but understanding these principles will make tackling data privacy questions on the exam easier, and it's going to make you better at your job going forward. So let's get into it here. We'll start with management. The organization defines documents, communicates, and assigns accountability for its privacy policies and procedures. And remember, responsibility goes back to the data controller, to the owner. Notice, the organization provides notice of its privacy policies and procedures. The organization identifies the purpose for which personal information is collected, used, and retained. Choice and consent. The organization describes the choices available to the individual and secures implicit or explicit consent regarding the collection, use, and disclosure of the personal data. Collection. Personal information is collected only for the purposes identified in the notice provided to the individual. 
and use retention and disposal. The personal information is limited to the purposes identified in the notice the individual consented to, which is the why the org can retain and when they must dispose of that data. But you should notice some themes in here when we're looking at these standards and the laws around data privacy. GDPR may be the gold standard, but you'll notice some themes in terms of the privacy principles that frameworks like the generally accepted privacy principles put out here. So these are the first five. And moving on, we have access. The organization provides individuals with access to their personal information for review or update. Disclosure to third parties. Personal information is disclosed to third parties only for the identified purposes with implicit or explicit consent of the individual. Security for privacy. Personal information is protected against both physical and logical unauthorized access. Quality. The organization maintains accurate, complete, and relevant personal information that is necessary for the purposes identified. And monitoring and enforcement. The organization monitors compliance with its privacy policies and procedures, and it also has procedures in place to address privacy-related complaints and disputes. We see a lot of themes here very similar to the rights outlined for data subjects in GDPR, which is a good thing. So 6, 7, 8, 9, and 10 right here. And again, you don't need to memorize these as GAP privacy principles, but understanding these concepts as they broadly apply across many laws, frameworks, and standards going to make the exam easier and it's going to make you more effective in your job going forward. To polish off section 6.1 we have the privacy impact assessment. So what is a PIA? It is designed to identify privacy data being collected, processed, or stored by a system and to assess the effects of a data breach. So when is a PIA necessary? Well, several privacy laws explicitly require PIAs as a planning tool for identifying and implementing required privacy controls. That would include GDPR and HIPAA. Conducting a PIA typically begins when a system or process is being evaluated, so before implementation. However, evolving privacy regulation often necessitates assessment of existing systems. To conduct an effective PIA, you have to define the assessment scope, the data collection methods, and plan for data retention. And in fact, the International Association of Privacy Professionals has published guides and resources related to privacy efforts, including conduction of a privacy impact assessment. And that brings us to section 6.3, understand audit process, methodologies, and required adaptations for a cloud environment. There's quite a lot of ground to cover in section 6.3. We'll talk about internal and external audit controls, the impact of audit requirements, identifying assurance challenges of virtualization and cloud, types of audit reports, restrictions of audit scope statements, gap analysis, audit planning, internal information security management system, or ISMS, Internal Information Security Control System, Policies, the Identification and Involvement of Relevant Stakeholders, Specialized Compliance Requirements for Highly Regulated Industries, and finally, the Impact of Distributed Information Technology Models, really speaking to the geographically diverse nature of the cloud. We'll start with a look at a few core auditing concepts, beginning with the question, what is auditing? So auditing is the methodical examination of an environment to ensure compliance with regulations, detect abnormalities, unauthorized occurrences, or outright crimes. The process of auditing is a detective control. Frequency is based on risk, and the degree of that risk also affects how often an audit is performed. So when we think about external independent audits, often annual is the frequency. But internal audits should be happening much more often on the whole. So IT relies on audits to identify issues before we expose our environment to external auditors. And audits are an element of due care. 
Security audits and effectiveness reviews are key elements in displaying due care because without them, senior management would likely be held accountable and liable for any asset losses that occur. And that due care obligation is very important. We have to demonstrate that we're acting with common sense, prudent management, and taking responsible action to address risk. And some of those due care obligations that come with regulation roll up to your executives in terms of responsibility. Just as the data controller is responsible for any data breach and ensuring that due care is taken to secure data, ultimate responsibility for compliance of an organization rolls up to its leadership. And security and audit reviews serve important internal functions. They help ensure that management programs are effective and being followed. And they're commonly associated with account management practices to prevent violations with least privilege or need to know principles. Can also be performed to oversee many programs and processes, so a layer of governance. Patch management, vulnerability management, change management, configuration management. All important processes that impact security and all processes that can be audited or reviewed on a periodic basis to ensure they are still relevant and effective in our environment. And just a side note from the real world about controlling access to audit reports. Because audit reports often contain sensitive information, and they often include the purpose and scope of the audit, and the results that were discovered or revealed. And we may not want that to be widespread knowledge throughout the organization. They can include sensitive information like problems, standards, causes, and recommendations. Details about security deficiencies that have been discovered, for example. So only people with sufficient privilege and need should have access. For example, senior security administrators would see the full detail of an audit, particularly if they are responsible for closing the gaps. Your senior management would get a high-level summary. Senior management would want to know if deviations or deficiencies had been discovered and that there was a game plan to close those gaps. So the internal auditor acts as a trusted advisor to the organization on risk, educating stakeholders, assessing compliance. Compliance may mean company policies or regulatory compliance. The definition is going to vary based on the company and the environment. And an internal audit can provide more continuous monitoring of control effectiveness and policy compliance, more so than an annual audit. And it enables the organization to catch and fix any issues before they show up on a formal audit report. Internal audits can also mitigate risk by examining cloud architectures to provide insights into an organization's cloud governance, data classification strategy, identity and access management effectiveness, regulatory compliance, privacy compliance, cyber threats. What's the security posture? An internal auditor is an independent entity, though, who can provide facts without fear of reprisal. And some legal and regulatory frameworks require the use of an independent auditor. Others demand a third-party auditor. But that's an important implementation detail, that even an internal auditor should be independent. Which in this case means essentially free to speak their mind. The requirement to conduct audits can have a large procedural and financial impact on a company as well. So in regulated industries, for example, we see numerous auditing requirements like banks, critical infrastructure providers, and healthcare. So more auditors and more specialized audit requirements are going to increase that cost. With multinational companies, audit complexity may be higher due to conflicting requirements, conflicting laws, for example. And in large environments, we'll see representative samples used to assess compliance on a manageable scale. So a random sample rather than an explicit check of every one of a hundred servers, we'll see a representative sample of 20 of those servers pulled, for example, to ensure that configuration is consistent across the sample. Multi-region data dispersion in the cloud and dynamic VM failure in hypervisors can definitely also complicate the audit process for the simple reason that it can be difficult to locate exactly where that virtual infrastructure was hosted. So getting to the audit trail itself can be a challenge. 
With that being said, you may see questions around assurance challenges with virtualization and cloud on the exam, because the cloud is made possible by virtualization technologies that enable dynamic environments needed for a global provider platform. And it's that dynamic nature that can make audit very challenging, because depending on the cloud architecture employed, a cloud security professional may need to go through multiple layers of auditing. And to be effective, the auditor must understand the virtualization architecture of the cloud provider. In fact, it will be absolutely necessary in tracing the true sequence of events and finding that true audit trail. So the provider, the CSP, really owns the audits of controls over the hypervisor. So Microsoft, Amazon, Google, they're basically in control of the logging and monitoring of the physical virtualization infrastructure. And the customer has VMs deployed on top of that hardware and those are usually owned, managed, and audited by the customer, the cloud consumer. So let's switch gears and talk through a few types of audit reports, some audit standards. And we'll start with the statements on standards for attestation engagements. The SSAE 18 is a set of standards defined by the American Institute of CPAs. It's designed to enhance the quality and usefulness of system and organization control, or SOC, reports. It includes audit standards and suggested report formats to guide and assist auditors. And you'll want to be familiar with the SSAE report types. So there's the SOC 1, which deals mainly with financial controls, and these are used primarily by CPAs auditing financial statements. Where you want to focus is on the SOC 2. So there's the SOC 2 Type 1, which is a report that assesses the design of security processes at a specific point in time. There's the SOC 2 Type 2, often written as Type 2 with Roman numerals, assesses how effective those controls are over time by observing operations for at least six months. It often requires an NDA in order to see that report due to sensitive contents. In fact, you'll see that with your major CSPs. As a customer, you'll have access to a SOC 2 Type 2 report since you can't perform a direct audit, but you will typically have to agree to an NDA before that report is served up to you in the cloud portal. Then there's the SOC 3 report, which contains only the auditor's general opinions and generally non-sensitive data and is shareable publicly. So the SSAE is US-based, of course, but SOC 2 has become something of a de facto global standard when it comes to audit, especially in the technical realm and in the cloud. SOC 2 Type 2 gives us that high assurance we're looking for as a cloud consumer. And next we have the International Standard on Assurance Engagements, the ISAE. This is the International Auditing and Assurance Standards Board, which issues the ISAE report. And this board and its standards are similar to what we see in the SSAE. The ISAE 3402 standard is roughly equivalent to the SOC 2 reports, just used less frequently. And then we have the Cloud Security Alliance, which has the Security Trust Assurance and Risk Certification Program, or STAR program it's called. And this can be used by cloud service providers, cloud customers, auditors, consultants. It's designed to demonstrate compliance to a desired level of assurance. And STAR consists of two levels of certification, which provides increasing levels of assurance. So breaking that down just a bit further, Level 1 is self-assessment, a complementary offering that documents the security controls provided by the CSP. Level 2 would be a third-party audit, which requires the CSP to engage an independent external auditor to evaluate the CSP's controls against the CSA standard. So, of course, that Level 2 external audit is going to be stronger as it's conducted by an external, definitely independent, trained, qualified auditor. And audit scope statements provide the reader with details on what was actually included in the audit and what was not. An audit scope statement generally includes a statement of purpose and objectives, the scope of the audit and explicit exclusions, the type of audit, security assessment requirements, assessment criteria and the rating scale that's going to be used in the report, the criteria for acceptance, expected deliverables, so what are the outputs of the audit, and classification, which is going to determine who gets access. 
how restrictive we are of visibility of the outcome of this audit. And setting parameters for an audit is known as audit scope restrictions. So who determines audit scope? Well, audit scope is usually a joint activity performed by the organization being audited and their auditor. And that's not to say that that auditor won't have their limits, especially in a third-party audit. So why limit the scope of an audit? Well, audits are expensive endeavors that can engage highly trained and highly paid content experts. Auditing of systems can affect system performance and in some cases require the downtime of production systems. And a new system not yet in production without all the planned controls in place is not ready to audit anyway. And in other cases, the cost of implementing controls and auditing some systems is too high relative to the revenue the service generates. Now, a gap analysis identifies where an organization does not currently meet requirements, and it provides important information to help the IT organization remediate gaps, particularly before a third-party audit. The main purpose is to compare the organization's current practices against a specified framework and to identify gaps between the two and it may be performed by either internal or external parties. And that is to say some organizations, especially in regulated industries, will hire an external auditor to come assess their readiness before the third party independent auditor comes in to perform the actual audit. The choice of which is usually driven by cost and the need for objectivity. So know when a gap analysis is useful on exam day. You know, as a precursor to a formal audit process so the organization can close gaps before that third-party external audit. Or when assessing the impact of changes to regulatory and compliance frameworks which introduce new or modified requirements. So ISO 27002 and the NIST cybersecurity frameworks are two frameworks commonly used for gap analysis. Let's have a look at audit planning and audit phases. So the audit process can generally be broken down into four phases, starting with audit planning. Audit planning includes documenting and defining the audit program objectives, and this is collaborative internal planning of audit scope and objectives. This will involve the security organization, key business stakeholders, potentially legal in regulatory situations. Gap analysis or a readiness assessment, basically assessing the organization's ability to undergo that full audit. Defining audit objectives and deliverables, that's going to be important to identify the expected outputs from the audit. And finally, identifying auditors and qualifications. Compliance and audit frameworks usually specify the type of auditor you need. Then there are phases to the audit itself, and in fact there are three major phases of an audit which include the audit field work, which involves the actual work the auditors perform to gather, test, and evaluate the organization. Audit reporting, and that report writing begins as the auditors conduct their field work, capturing their notes and any findings they're going to put into their final report. And the audit follow-up, the activities that may be conducted after the audit including addressing any identified weaknesses that come in that audit report. You'll want to be familiar with Information Security Management System, ISMS for the exam, which is a systematic approach to information security. It focuses on processes, technology, and people, and it's designed to help protect and manage an organization's information. ISO 27001 addresses need and approaches to implementing ISMS. ISMS functions include quantifying risk, developing and executing risk mitigation strategies, and providing formal reporting on status of mitigation efforts. And there are several benefits to ISMS as well, including improving data security, increased organizational resilience to cyber attacks, central information security management, and formal risk management. And then we have Internal Information Security Control Systems. It sounds quite a lot like Information Security Management Systems, but you don't want to get these two mixed up. So, an Information Security Control System provides guidance for mitigating the risks identified as part of the ISMS risk management processes. And there are several frameworks to choose from for your Information Security Control System. The scoping controls refer to 
reviewing controls in the framework to identify which controls apply to the organization and which do not. Tailoring is a process of matching applicable controls with the organization's specific circumstances to which they apply. And organizations implementing ISO 27001 ISMS will find that the ISO 27002 controls are very easy to use because they're actually designed to work together. They fit together. Other control frameworks include NIST SP800-53, the NIST Cybersecurity Framework, the Secure Controls Framework, and the Cloud Security Alliance Cloud Controls Matrix, or CCM. You'll want to be familiar with the function of policies and a couple of specific policy types for the exam, particularly organizational versus functional policies. So policies are a key part of any data security strategy and they facilitate a number of capabilities for an organization. For one, they provide users and organizations with a way to understand and enforce requirements in a systematic and consistent way. They make employees and management aware of their roles and responsibilities. They standardize secure practices throughout the organization. You want to know the difference between organizational and functional policies and how they should be applied to the cloud. So let's dive into those just a bit further, starting with organizational policies. So companies use policies to outline rules and guidelines, usually complemented by documentation, such as procedures and job aids. Organizations will typically define policies related to proper use of company resources like expense reimbursements and travel. Policies are a proactive risk mitigation tool designed to reduce the likelihood of risks like financial losses, data loss or leakage, reputational damage, statutory and regulatory compliance issues, abuse or misuse of computing systems and resources. And to that effect, employees should generally sign policies to acknowledge acceptance. And we can juxtapose the organizational policy to a functional policy. So what is a functional policy? Well, it's a set of standardized definitions for employees that describe how they make use of systems or data. They typically guide specific activities crucial to the organization, like appropriate handling of data, vulnerability management, and other security activities, for example. Functional policies typically codify requirements identified in the ISMS and they align to your chosen control framework. So a few examples of functional policies, not an exhaustive list, but to give you an idea for the exam. Acceptable use, what is and is not acceptable to do on company hardware and networks. Email use, what is and is not acceptable to do on email accounts. Password and access management. Notes on password complexity, expiration, reuse, requirements for MFA, and requirements for access management tools like a password manager. Incident response. Details on how incidents are handled and requirements for defining an incident response plan. Data classification, which would identify types of data and how each should be handled. Network services, how issues like remote access and network security are handled. Vulnerability scanning, the routines and limitations on internal scanning and penetration testing. And patch management, how equipment is patched and on what schedule. So as you can see, a lot of very function-specific policies. Policies are even more important when we move to the cloud, in part due to ease of use. The ease of deploying cloud resources without governance results in what we call shadow IT, basically resources deployed without IT approval and sometimes without IT knowledge. This can create security risks, like data loss or leakage through unauthorized use of cloud storage services. And cloud storage, to my recollection, is really where we saw shadow IT first crop up with the widespread use of Dropbox and Box and OneDrive when our non-IT users discovered that it was an easy way to collaborate with people in the organization and even at other organizations. It also creates financial risks such as spending being more difficult to measure and control. And these financial risks are real. I remember one organization where the CIO was told he was out of budget and he said, no, here's my budget. We're well within range. But when the expense reports came in, it turned out that the development organization was using a massive amount of public cloud 
on their own expense account in order to get their work done more quickly. And that's true of shadow IT. It's generally not a malicious activity. It's simply well-meaning users trying to be more effective in getting their job done and potentially working around the delays of IT. So cloud services should be included in organization policies and requirements for use clearly documented. In fact, you want to sanction or approve which services can be used for which functions. Which public cloud are you going to use for IaaS, for example? What will be your cloud storage vendors? What are you going to use for a password vault? But policies should define requirements users must adhere to and specify which services are approved for those various uses. And in fact, a cloud access security broker can help identify and stop shadow IT. We'll use a CASB to monitor our users' use of our data and their use of apps to identify unsanctioned or unapproved apps and potential oversharing of data, just as a couple of examples. In fact, a CASB is frequently a good way to identify insider threats, identify mass deletion or mass download of documents, of sensitive data. We see identification and involvement of relevant stakeholders called out explicitly in the syllabus. And one key challenge of the audit process is the inclusion of any relevant stakeholders. So who are relevant stakeholders exactly? Well, organizations management who will likely be paying for the audit. Security practitioners responsible for facilitating the audit. Employees who will be called on to provide evidence to auditors in the form of documentation, artifacts, or even sitting for interviews. And we'll see oftentimes that cloud computing environments can include more stakeholders than on-premises or even multiple CSPs, simply more parties involved in service delivery and infrastructure management. You may see some questions around requirements for highly regulated industries, and many CSPs have compliance-focused cloud service offerings which meet the requirements of specific regulatory or legal frameworks. In fact, it is a big selling point that those big CSPs will leverage. For example, NERC requirements, the North American Electric Reliability Corporation Critical Infrastructure Protection regulates organizations involved in power generation and distribution. So you can imagine requirements are very stringent where human safety is involved. On that note, HIPAA High Tech both deal with PHI and implement specific requirements for security and privacy protections, as well as breach notification requirements. And HIPAA high tech don't specifically address cloud computing. High tech came along later and updated HIPAA, but it's very much a regulation that your major CSPs will address in providing their certifications to prospective customers. Then we have PCI DSS, which specifies protections for payment card transaction data. Also, no specific mention of cloud here. Although we can certainly expect that will change over time as these laws and standards are revised. CSPs generally make the controls available, but remember responsibility for compliance to any relevant regulations ultimately rests with the cloud consumer. The syllabus explicitly calls out the impact of the distributed IT model. Because cloud computing enables distributed IT service delivery with systems that can automatically replicate data globally. So just one impact of the distributed model is the additional geographic locations auditors must consider when they're performing an audit. And we've talked about some of the potential legal conflicts this can generate. A common technique in cloud audits is sampling, which is the act of picking a subset of the system's physical infrastructure to inspect. In fact, we looked at an example of this a bit earlier in this session. CSPs have found ways to collect evidence that provide auditors with sufficient assurance that they've collected a representative sample. For example, we talked about sampling 20 servers of 100 servers across many regions to save time and expense while maintaining accuracy of the audit process. And that does it for 6.3, so we're on to 6.4, Understand Implications of Cloud to enterprise risk management. Topics called out in the syllabus for 6.4 include assess providers' risk management programs. In particular, we'll talk about risk profiles and appetite, the difference between the data owner or controller role versus data custodian or processor. 
regulatory transparency requirements in regulatory standards. We'll talk about breach notification and some of the requirements we see in regulations like SOX or GDPR. Risk treatment, responses to risk, in other words. Different risk frameworks we can use. Metrics for risk management and assessment of the risk environment. So assessing providers' risk management programs and reviewing provider controls can be particularly challenging in the cloud. So prior to establishing a relationship with a cloud provider with a CSP, a customer needs to analyze the risks associated with adopting that provider services. And rather than performing a direct audit, the customer generally has to rely on their supply chain risk management processes and the third-party audit reports that a CSP will provide. So the primary areas of focus of a supply chain risk management process include determining whether a supplier has a risk management program in place, and if so, whether the risks identified by that program are being adequately mitigated. But again, unlike traditional risk management activities we'd see on-premises, a CRM and a CSP scenario often requires customers to take that indirect approach by reviewing audit reports. And again, we've seen this in previous domains. Major CSPs all make available the SOC 2, ISO 27001, FedRAMP, or CSA star audit reports in lieu of a direct audit, providing that high level of assurance without the need for the cloud consumer, the organization, to audit the CSP directly. So in reviewing an audit report from a CSP, there are several key elements of the report you want to focus on, such as the scoping information or the description of the audit target. This is going to tell us how comprehensive the audit was in the report we're reading. Some compliance frameworks allow audits to be very narrowly scoped, like a SOC 2. But if the CSP's SOC 2 audit did not cover a specific service that a customer wants to adopt, then the audit finding doesn't provide any real value. That report may be assessing risk, but it's not that particular customer's risk if it doesn't have that specific service in scope. And this may drive changes like enhanced customer-side controls, tracking the CSP's mitigation and resolution efforts, or migrating to another CSP altogether. And there are some resources out there that can help organizations build or enhance their supply chain risk management program you'll want to be familiar with. NIST has a resource library that includes working groups, publications, and a number of other resources. You can get that URL from the PDF that comes with this course. And then we have ISO 27000, which is a security management system for security and resilience with particular focus on supply chain management. Now, the risk profile describes the risk present in the organization based on all the identified risks and any associated mitigations in place. And the risk appetite describes the amount of risk an organization is willing to accept without mitigating. And what an organization is willing to accept without mitigating really depends on the type of business they're in and, and the degree of risk we're dealing with. Regulated industries will be more apt to mitigation, transference, and avoidance of risk altogether. Smaller organizations and startups will be more apt to simply accept risks to avoid cost of treatment. You can imagine that an early stage startup without a lot of cash is going to opt for spending less where they can. So GDPR data roles and responsibilities. We saw specifically in the syllabus the call to knowing the difference between the processor and custodian roles. So the data processor is anyone who processes personal data on behalf of the data controller. So the data processor is also the data custodian in other standards. GDPR calls that role the data processor. And the processor is responsible for the safe and private custody, transport, and storage of the data. The data controller is the person or entity that controls processing of the data, the owner. So what GDPR calls the data controller role would be the data owner in certain other frameworks. They own the data and the risks associated with any data breaches. When data controllers use processors, they must ensure that the security requirements follow the data. And to be crystal clear, while the data processor is acting on behalf of the controller, 
the data controller ultimately owns responsibility. GDPR also defines the data protection officer who ensures the organization complies with data regulations. Under GDPR, the DPO is a mandatory appointment. And the data subject, again, is the individual or entity that is the subject of the personal data, the person about whom data has been collected. And because they're called out in the syllabus, you'll want to be sure you're able to identify each of these data roles. So the data owner, usually a member of senior management, can delegate some day-to-day -day duties, cannot delegate total responsibility. The data custodian, usually someone in the IT department, does implement controls for the data owner, does not decide what controls are needed. In fact, on the exam, if the question mentions day-to-day, -day, it's likely data custodian is your answer. And remember, for GDPR, the data owner is the data controller, and the custodian is the data processor. Transparency requirements are called out in the syllabus as well, which speaks to breach notification. So a cloud security professional should definitely be aware of the transparency requirements imposed on data controllers by various regulations and laws around the world. Most recent privacy laws include a mandatory breach notification, and there are some variations amongst the laws how long an organization has to respond. In fact, mainly around issues of timing of the notification and who must be notified will vary across standards. But regulations that require breach notifications include GDPR, HIPAA, GLBA, and the Canadian PEPITA regulation. In fact, incident response plans and procedures should include relevant information about the time period for reporting as well as the required contacts in the event of a data breach. Essentially, who should be notified and how quickly. Sarbanes-Oxley. So if a company is publicly traded in the United States, they're going to be subject to transparency requirements called out in the Sarbanes-Oxley Act. So under SOX, specifically as data owners, these companies have to consider the following. Section 802, it's a crime to destroy, change, or hide documents to prevent their use in official legal processes. Section 804, companies must keep audit-related records for a minimum of five years. SOX compliance is often an issue with both data breaches and ransomware incidents at publicly traded companies. The loss of data related to compliance due to external actors does not protect a company from their legal obligations. That's kind of a, the dog ate my homework defense that doesn't protect the organization. Likewise, GDPR has some explicit transparency requirements. For companies doing business in the European Union or with citizens of the EU, transparency requirements under GDPR are laid out in Article 12. There's a link in the PDF with the course if you'd like to take a look. But GDPR states that a data controller must be able to demonstrate that personal data are processed in a manner transparent to the data subject. The obligations for transparency begin at the data collection stage and apply throughout the life cycle of processing. In fact, it stipulates that communication to data subjects must be concise, transparent, intelligible, and easily accessible, and the use of clear and plain language, which means an organization cannot hide behind confusing jargon to take power away from the data subject or to fool them in any way. Meeting the requirements for transparency also requires processes for providing data subjects with access to their data. In GDPR, the subject has the right to ask an organization to correct the data if it's incorrect, and they can also ask to be forgotten, basically remove my data. Risk treatment is also called out in the syllabus. The practice of modifying risks, generally lowering risk. It typically begins with identifying and assessing risks by measuring the likelihood and the impact. Risks most likely to occur and most impactful would be prioritized for treatment. In a nutshell, risk treatment is the organization's response to risk. And you'll want to be familiar with these potential responses for the exam. We have risk avoidance where the organization changes business practices to completely eliminate the potential 
that a risk will materialize, a particular risk. This can negatively impact business opportunities because the organization may avoid certain business opportunities entirely to avoid the risk associated with them. There's risk mitigation, which is the process of applying security controls to reduce the probability and or the magnitude of a risk. There's risk transference, which shifts some of the impact of the risk from the organization experiencing the risk to another entity, for example, cyber insurance. And then there's risk acceptance, deliberately choosing to take no other risk management strategy and to simply continue operations as normal in the face of a risk, common when the cost of mitigation is greater than the cost of the impact of the risk itself. The mitigation would not be cost effective, so it is therefore unnecessary. You want to know these concepts and be ready to recognize examples on the exam. Also called out in the syllabus is risk appetite, sometimes called risk tolerance. It's the amount of risk a company is willing to accept. Now, these terms risk appetite and risk tolerance are sometimes used interchangeably. There are definitely experts out there that can articulate a subtle difference. For purposes of this exam, risk appetite and risk tolerance are the same. Regulations that affect risk posture. So regulations addressing data privacy and security that influence an organization's risk posture would include GDPR, SOX, HIPAA, and PCI DSS, just to name a few, and all called out in the exam syllabus in multiple places. So I mentioned security controls are used in risk mitigation. They are risk treatments for countering and minimizing loss or unavailability of services or apps due to vulnerabilities. Now the terms safeguards and countermeasures often seem to be used interchangeably. Technically, safeguards are proactive. They reduce the likelihood of occurrence. Countermeasures are reactive. They reduce the impact after occurrence. And there are definitely some risk management frameworks available for security practitioners to use as guides when they're designing a risk management program. And in the cloud computing arena, I'd suggest being familiar with these risk frameworks at minimum for the exam. We have ISO 31000, ENISA's Cloud Computing Risk Assessment, NIST 800-37, the Risk Management Framework, and another worth mentioning is NIST 800-146, the Cloud Computing Synopsis and Recommendation. This is not a dedicated risk management standard, but does mention the various risks and benefits associated with different deployment and service models. Let's go a bit deeper on these, starting with ISO 31000, which actually contains several standards related to building and running a risk management program. There's ISO 31000, Risk Management Guidelines, which provides the foundation of an organization's risk management function. You have IEC 31010, Risk Management Risk Assessment Techniques. It provides guidance on conducting a risk assessment. And ISO Guide 73, Risk Management Vocabulary, which provides a standard set of terminology used through the other documents, and it's useful for defining elements of the risk management program. Good for making sure everyone is speaking the same language, so to speak. And from NIST, we have NIST Special Publication 800-37, the Risk Management Framework. We have NIST Special Publication 800-146, Cloud Computing Synopsis and Recommendations, which provides definition of various cloud computing terms. And from ANISA, ANISA produces several useful resources related to cloud-specific risks that organizations should be aware of and plan for when they're designing cloud computing systems. The guide from ANISA identifies various categories of risks and recommendations for organizations to consider when evaluating cloud computing. And these include research recommendations to advance the field of cloud computing, legal risks, security risks. ANISA is a rough equivalent to the U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology. ANISA is the European Union Agency for Cybersecurity, so it's the European equivalent of NIST, more or less. 
Risk metrics are called out in the syllabus, and there are some key cybersecurity metrics that companies can track to present measurable data to company stakeholders. For example, patching levels. How many devices are fully patched and up to date? Unpatched devices often contain exploitable vulnerabilities. In quarterly reports, I like to show not only our patching levels for devices, but to call out some little details, like the fact that we're patching firmware, for example, that we're patching our network devices, that we're patching not only the core operating system, our Microsoft software, but all of our third-party software. Time to deploy patches. How many devices received required patches in the divine timeframes? This is a useful measure of how effective a patch management program is at reducing the risk of known vulnerabilities and getting some of those out of band emergency zero-day type patches out the door quickly. Intrusion attempts. How many times have known actors tried to breach cloud systems? And how many of those attacks were effective in some way? Increased intrusion attempts can be an indicator of an increased likelihood of risk. And then some common acronyms. Mean time to detect, mean time to contain, and mean time to resolve. How long does it take for security teams to become aware of a potential security incident to contain the damage and resolve the incident? Inadequate tools or resources for reactive risk mitigation can also increase the impact of risks occurring. Cybersecurity metrics provide absolutely vital information for decision makers in the organization in prioritizing their treatment of risk and their need to evolve their strategy in particular areas. At the end of the day, cybersecurity metrics within expected parameters indicate risk mitigations are effective. Metrics that deviate from the expected parameters are no longer effective and should be reviewed. Assessment of risk environment is called out in the syllabus, and the cloud being a critical operating component for many organizations, it's very important to identify and understand the risks posed by the CSP, because the greater the dependency on the CSP, the greater the risk. We are handing over responsibility for elements of our compute environment, and with that, some level of control over our compute environment and our ability to respond and collect data in security incident circumstances. It's important to ask a number of questions when considering a cloud service, a vendor, or an infrastructure provider. For example, is the provider subject to takeover or acquisition? Are we going to see an ownership change that may result in a change to our contract terms? How financially stable is the provider? Will they be around for the long term? In what legal jurisdictions are the provider's offices located? In other words, what regulations and laws are we likely to be subjected to as a customer? Are there outstanding lawsuits against the provider that may affect their financial stability and their long-term presence? What pricing protections are in place for services we're contracting? How will a provider satisfy any regulatory or legal compliance requirements? Do they have those audit reports from third parties that give us that high level of assurance? And what does failover, backup, and recovery look like for the provider? Do they have regional support to give us that DR capability in a sustainable fashion? Designing a supply chain risk management program to assess CSP or vendor risks is a due diligence practice. Actually performing the assessment is an example of due care. Remember the customer organization is responsible and any organization that uses cloud services without adequately mitigating the risks is likely to be found negligent in a breach which is going to pose problems for the data controller. To guide their risk assessment process, customers can leverage ISO IEC 15408-1 also known as the common criteria. It enables an objective evaluation to validate that a particular product or system satisfies a defined set of security requirements. It assures customers that security products they purchase have been thoroughly tested by independent third-party testers and meet the customer's requirements. This certification of the product only certifies product capabilities. 
If it's misconfigured or mismanaged, software is no more secure than anything else the customer might use. So again, as with the CSP, a software company may put the capability there, but leave it up to the customer to properly configure. It's designed to provide assurances for security claims by vendors. The evaluation is often done through testing laboratories where the product or platform is evaluated against a standard set of criteria. The result is an evaluation assurance level, which defines how robust the security capabilities are in the evaluated product. Most CSPs do not have common criteria evaluations over their entire environment, but many cloud-based products, SaaS products, may. It's up to the customer to review details of the common criteria assurances. To make sure that the scope of the evaluation and the level of assurance meet their requirements. The Cloud Security Alliance offers up STAR, Security, Trust, Assurance, and Risk, which is their assurance framework. So when evaluating risks in a specific CSP or other cloud service, the STAR can be a useful lightweight method for ascertaining risks. It contains evaluations of cloud services against CSA's cloud controls matrix. Organizations can opt for self-assessed or third-party assessed cloud services. Now that will affect the level of assurance, whether it's low assurance in the case of self-assessment or high assurance in the case of third-party. Overall, CSA STAR is considered lightweight, lower assurance certification for the CSPs that use it. Another option is the EU Cybersecurity Certification Scheme on Cloud Services, or EUCS. So ANISA has published a standard for certifying the cybersecurity practices present in cloud environments. And that framework is the EUCS. It defines a set of evaluation criteria for various cloud service and deployment models. The goal is producing security evaluation results that allow comparison of the security posture across different cloud providers. This standard was still under development as of 2022, so adoption is not yet widespread. I would expect any coverage on the exam is also going to be similarly limited. And that does it for 6.4. So that brings us to 6.5, understand outsourcing and cloud contract design. So here we'll cover business requirements like SLAs, MSAs, and SOWs, vendor management, contract management, and the clauses that should be present in your contracts with CSPs and similar vendors, and supply chain management. And one thing these topics all share in common is that they pertain to customer dealings with third parties. So let's start with a quick look at third party risks. First, we have the supply chain. And supply chain security has become a significant concern for organizations in recent years. This includes suppliers, manufacturers, distributors, and even customers when we think downstream in the supply chain. And a breach at any link in the supply chain can result in business impact. And then there's vendor management. Many organizations today are actually reducing the number of vendors they work with and requiring stricter onboarding procedures. Every customer I work with has some sort of vendor self-assessment or survey so they can gather an initial round of data from a potential vendor to assess the risk they may pose to the organization. And vendors may be required to submit to an external audit and agree to strict communication and reporting requirements in the event of potential breach. Certainly when business critical infrastructure and services are involved, this is going to be true. A compromised vendor opens the organization to the risk of an island hopping attack, where a bad actor attacks the organization from the perch of a compromised vendor where they've established a presence. And then we have system integration. So system integration partners working on systems have privileged remote or physical access often, necessitating security measures and process controls beyond the norm. The potential for increased risk of insider attack is one of many concerns here. So you may simply think of systems integrators as IT consultants. So let's talk 
business requirements, specifically SLA, MSA, and SAO. So starting with the master service agreement. In legal terms, a cloud customer and a CSP enter into a master service agreement. This is defined as any contract that two or more parties enter into as a service agreement. And the MSA should address compliance and process requirements the customer is passing along to the CSP. The MSA should include breach notification, CSP duty to inform the customer of a breach within a specific period of time after detection. Legal counsel is most often responsible for contracts, but security should be involved to share requirements to ensure legal captures all of the necessary elements and concerns in the MSA and other contracts. Next, we have the Service Level Agreement, or SLA. So SLAs stipulate performance expectations, such as maximum downtime, and often include penalties if the vendor doesn't meet expectations. These are generally used with external vendors like the CSP, and an SLA is legally binding. More specifically, an SLA often includes financial penalties for non-performance and may even allow a customer to terminate their contract early. Let's go a level deeper on SLAs. So SLAs should be written to ensure that the organization's service level requirements are met, and we need to make sure that in the SLA we're defining recurring, discrete, measurable items that the parties agree on as a clear measure of whether the SLA has been met or not. Common elements documented in SLAs include uptime guarantees, SLA violation penalties, SLA violation penalty exclusions and limitations, so limiting the size of a penalty potentially, suspension of service clauses, provider liability, data protection and management, disaster recovery and recovery point objective, so RTO and RPO, security and privacy notifications, and time frames. Just as an audit can be too narrowly scoped to be useful to a customer, an SLA can similarly be too narrowly scoped to be useful to a customer when they need it. Remember, you're not only handing responsibility over to the CSP, you're handing over some elements of control. And contracts, including those around service levels, give back a level of control to the customer. Leverage of a fashion to ensure that the CSP meets their obligations, or other vendor for that matter. So the statement of work. So this is a legal document usually created after an MSA has been executed and it governs a specific unit of work. The MSA may document services and prices, but a SAO covers requirements, expectations, and deliverables for a project. So in other words, the MSA focuses overall ongoing and a SAO is time limited and specific. A non-disclosure agreement. This is a contract with vendors and suppliers not to disclose the company's confidential information. A mutual NDA actually binds both parties in the agreement, and I do find those tend to be more common. Vendor management, also called out in the syllabus. Managing risk is complicated when parts of the organization's IT infrastructure exist outside the organization's direct control, as is the case in cloud computing. And the practices of supply chain risk management and vendor management overlap significantly. However, in many cases, vendor management will include more activities related to operational risks. Cloud computing involves outsourcing ongoing organizational processes and infrastructure to a service provider. Therefore, the cloud requires more continuous management activities to monitor and manage that vendor relationship. We're handling over a level of responsibility and a level of control that then requires continuous oversight on our part to manage our risk exposure. So cloud professionals also need strong project and people management skills to effectively perform vendor management activities. Key activities would be the initial vendor assessment where security practitioners should be involved in that initial selection process which involves assessing the security risks present in CSP and related services. For many customers, this process will entail reviewing security reports like a SOC 2 on an annual basis after the CSP 
has undergone their yearly audit, that indirect assessment through third-party audit documents. And we also need to assess vendor lock-in risks. This assessment will require knowledge of not only the CSP's offerings, but the architecture and strategy the customer organization intends to use. Using any unique CSP offerings, like artificial intelligence and machine learning platforms, can result in a service that is dependent on that specific CSP. We also need to assess vendor viability. This is often a process not conducted by the security team as it deals with operational risk rather than security risk. Assessing the viability of vendors may involve reviews of public information like financial statements, the CSP's performance history and reputation, or even formal reports like a SOC 1. A SOC 1 being a report that's more financially focused. But all of these identify potential weaknesses that could impact the CSP's ability to continue operations. And then there are Escrow options. So escrow is a legal term used when a trusted third party holds something on behalf of two or more other parties, such as source code or encryption keys. So let's just go through a common escrow scenario. A software development company may wish to protect the intellectual property of their source code. However, if they go out of business, their customers are left with an unmaintainable system and customers want assurance. In this scenario, an escrow provider could hold a copy of the source code and release it to customers in the event the provider is no longer in business. Contract management is another concern. Organizations need to employ adequate governance structures to monitor contract terms and performance, to be aware of outages and any violation of stated agreements. And that's where contract clauses come into play. A contract clause is a specific article of related information that specifies the agreement between the contracting parties. Some common contract clauses that should be considered for any CSP or other data service provider include the right to audit, metrics, definitions, termination, litigation, assurance, compliance, and access to the cloud or to our cloud data. So let's go through these at another level of detail. So the right to audit. A customer can request the right to audit the service provider to ensure compliance with the security requirements agreed to in the contract. Many of your CSPs write into their contract that you can rely on their standard third-party audits, their SOC 2, their ISO 27001 certification to be used in place of a customer-performed audit, so an indirect uh, but high assurance. Metrics. If there are any specific indicators that the service provider must provide to the customer, they can be documented in a contract and should be. Metrics tell you how compliance with the agreement will be measured. Definitions. So a contract is a legal agreement between multiple parties. Essential that all parties share a common understanding of the terms and expectations in that contract. Defining key terms like security, privacy, key practices, breach notifications can all avoid misunderstandings when problems arise. Termination. So this refers to ending the contractual agreement. This clause will typically define conditions under which either party may terminate the contract. It may also specify consequences if the contract is terminated early. Litigation. This is an area where legal counsel really must be consulted. It's agreeing to terms for litigation and can severely restrict the organization's ability to pursue damages if something goes wrong. Some contracts, for example, will mandate arbitration before litigation. Assurance. So this is defining assurance, and these requirements set expectations for both the provider and the customer. Many contracts specify that a provider must furnish a SOC 2 or equivalent to the customer on an annual basis as that level of assurance. Then there's compliance. So any customer compliance requirements that flow to the provider must be documented and agreed upon in the contract. Data controllers that use cloud providers as data processors 
have to ensure that adequate security safeguards are available for that data in the cloud. Access to the cloud or data. So clauses dealing with customer access can be used to avoid risks often associated with vendor lock-in. In the vein of contract management, you'll want to be familiar with cyber risk insurance. So cyber risk insurance is designed to help an organization reduce the financial impact of risk by transferring it to an insurance carrier. In the event of a security incident, the insurance carrier can help offset associated costs like digital forensics and investigation, data recovery, system restoration. They may even cover legal or regulatory fines associated with the incident, though that extra coverage you can bet will be reflected in the insurance premiums. Cyber insurance carriers are in the business of risk management, and as a result, they're unlikely to offer coverage to an organization lacking controls to mitigate risk. In fact, most will have specific requirements in terms of security controls they expect to be in place, language they expect to be in your contracts, and cyber insurance requires the organizations to pay a premium for the insurance plan, so they have to keep those premium payments up to date, and most plans will have a limit of coverage that caps how much the insurance carrier pays. In fact, there may also be sublimits which cap the amount that will be paid for specific types of incidents such as ransomware or phishing. An insurance broker can be a useful resource when investigating insurance options for your organization circumstances, including identifying the amount of coverage the organization needs, different types of coverage that are available such as business interruption or cyber extortion, security controls that the insurance carrier requires, such as multi-factor authentication, for example. Now, cyber risk insurance usually covers costs associated with investigation, direct business losses, recovery costs, legal notifications, lawsuits, extortion, and even food and related expenses. So let's dig into these clauses that we'd see in a typical cyber risk insurance contract. So investigation, these are costs associated with the forensic investigation to determine the extent of an incident. This often includes cost for third-party investigators. And at least one of the cyber risk insurers that I work with requires that they are the first point of contact when an incident is detected and they help manage the process, including the required communication. Direct business losses. These refer to direct monetary losses associated with downtime or data recovery, overtime for employees, and oftentimes reputational damages to the organization. Recovery costs. These may include costs associated with replacing hardware or provisioning temporary cloud environments during contingency operations. They may also include services like forensic data recovery or negotiations with attackers to assist in recovery. Legal notifications. So costs are associated with required privacy and breach notifications required by relevant laws. And lawsuits. Policies can be written to cover losses and payouts due to class action or other lawsuits against a company after a cyber incident. The insurance company may pay out ransomware demands. And this Extortion clause is growing in popularity. This may include direct payments to ensure data privacy or accessibility by the company. We don't like to encourage payout of ransom demands as a practice, but that extortion option is available. Food and related expenses. This is pretty simple, actually. Incidents often require employees to work extended hours or to travel to contingency sites. So these are just costs associated with incident response, including catering, lodging, and it may be covered even though they're not usually thought of as IT costs. And to wrap up 6.5, let's talk about supply chain management. The managing risk in the supply chain focuses on both operational risks, which ensures that suppliers are capable of providing the needed services, and security risks. The supply chain should always be considered in any business continuity or disaster recovery planning. Proactive measures include contract language and assurance processes that can be used to quantify the risks associated with using suppliers like CSPs, as well as to gauge the effectiveness of these suppliers' risk management programs. 
So there are some standards we can lean on here. There's ISO IEC 27036, which is cybersecurity supplier relationships. The ISO 27000 family of standards includes a specific ISO standard dedicated to supply chain cybersecurity risk management, and that is 27036. It provides a set of practices and guidance for managing cybersecurity risks in supplier relationships. The standard is particularly useful for organizations that use ISO 27001 for building an ISMS or ISO 31000 for risk management. They're building on the concepts found in those standards in ISO IEC 27036. And ISO 27036 is comprised of four parts, including overview and concepts, requirements, guidelines for information and communication technology supply chain security, and guidelines for security of cloud services. So we see cloud services get specific mention here. And ISO 27036, like the other ISO standards, is not a free resource. There's generally a cost associated with getting your hands on that document. So let's look at the four parts, beginning with overview and concepts, which provides an overview and foundation for a supply chain management capability. Part two covers a set of best practices and techniques for designing and implementing the supply chain management function. Part three is of particular concern for security practitioners as it lays out practices and techniques specific to managing security risks in the supply chain. And part four, which is most relevant to cloud security practitioners in particular, this standard deals with practices and requirements for managing supply chain security risks specific to cloud computing and the CSP. And some additional resources worth a mention when we're talking about supply chain. There's NIST IR 8276, which is Key Practices in Cyber Supply Chain Risk Management. NIST 800-161, which is Cybersecurity Supply Chain Risk Management Practices for Systems and Organizations. And the ANISA publication, Supply Chain Integrity, an overview of the ICT supply chain risks and challenges, and vision for the way forward that was published back in 2015. And congratulations, you've reached the end of Domain 6 and completion of the CCSP Exam Cram series. As always, I hope you're getting value from the series. Leave me any questions in the comments below this video or reach out on LinkedIn to chat and I'll look forward to seeing you in future exam cram series and until next time take care and stay safe